Welcome to Ordinary to Badass. Whether you're ordinary or badass, I'm so glad you're here. Today's guest is Catherine Dummett. Catherine, thank you so much for being here. Excited to have you on the show. Thanks, Marie. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. So before we go any further, I've got to ask you, do you consider yourself ordinary or badass? Oh, 100%. I am a badass. I think um, we as women, we we all are. Uh, I think back to this tweet I saw and, you know, take that with a grain of salt, but there is a lot of credibility to what I'm about to say. Um, I saw this tweet from Adam Grant. For those of you who aren't familiar, he is this awesome New York Times bestseller and as well as a Wharton School psychologist. And I'm going to quote him because I think it, it's just so incredible what he, he tweeted. 95 studies, 100,000 plus leaders. Men are more confident, but women are more competent. Are women biologically wired to be better? Doubtful. Have they had to be better to overcome biases and break glass ceilings? Likely. We're long overdue to stop mistaking attitude for aptitude. I saw that and that just like hit home for me. I just feel like that hits the nail on the head. And like we as women have had to overcome so many biases, so many different challenges to get to where we all collectively are today. Um, I know I'm incredibly privileged and there's still so much more to do, but as a result, we're all badasses. <laughs> I love that. Have you always felt that way? No, not at all. I think, um, I think with age, you know, comes confidence, um, which is, is nice. I always heard like, oh, you know, you're going to be self-conscious until you're in your thirties. And, you know, like it really was true, but also I think what helped gain confidence for me was, was seeing professional success that helped me find confidence in many wins across, you know, the first decade of my career. Um, but I would have probably said I was ordinary if you had asked me 10, 15 years ago, which is really sad. Right. I know. It's like, why aren't girls taught this younger? <laughs> I know it's really awful, actually. Like, what can we do now that we've gone through these motions now that we're talking about it more to make sure that like our daughters, the next generation of women don't feel this way? Like, how can we get in front of it? Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And I think that there's so much that we forget that is just done through observation like mm -hmm. us doing it and putting in the work to be badasses ourselves and to own our badassery and the other generations see us, you know, just by taking action ourselves. Absolutely. And it's so interesting. I, I think about, um, there was a woman I met in my career, like very early on. And she was always saying, she was like, Catherine, you have to be your own advocate. You have to be your best cheerleader. And it's like so much easier said than done, but it's like one of those things like fake it until you make it. And it really does like just by faking it, it makes you just kind of absorb and ultimately become it, um, which I don't know if that's like the best advice, but it does work. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And I think sometimes people think like being a cheerleader for yourself, like that that's weird or corny or like, why would you talk to yourself that way? But it's like, why would you not? You know, it's so important. I know, you know, it's like, uh, I think about the whole self-love, self-care movement that's like really come on the scene in the like last five years. And everyone is talking about like, you can't love someone else until you love yourself. Or like, you know, you talk to yourself in like a certain negative way, but you never talk to others that way. And it's so nice to now have these moments where people are like really encouraging others and themselves to take a step back and treat yourself with the same respect you're giving others. It's like Absolutely. the reverse <laughs> golden rule. It's like the reverse golden rule, right? <laughs> Yes. So good. I'm so excited for this conversation, but first, can you take a second and tell us about yourself? Oh, absolutely. So, um, I am a VP of marketing at a company called Narvar. We enable brands to connect with consumers beyond the buy button. So I think about how I'm an avid Lululemon shopper. I buy way too much, uh, too many of their leggings. Um, but what we're doing with Lululemon, and I'm just going to use them as an example, we help delight their customers after they put, purchase those leggings online. Everything from the notification emails to, hey, your order has been delivered to helping facilitate returns. Um, it's a really fun place to be in and fun space, uh, being in you know an arena where we're empowering great customer experiences. But the first decade of my career, I spent 
first in sales, um, starting as an SDR, making a hundred cold calls a day. And then I went into ad, to, ad tech and MarTech, which was all about getting someone to buy something at any given point in time. And it just felt really impersonal. Um, and so I, I had to make a change. I made the change last year and it's been, it's been really great. Okay. So would you talk about that for a second? You said it felt really impersonal and that you had to make a change. Like, what did you feel inside? What was going on inside your head? And then what led you to like, take a leap and make a change? Yeah. So, um, I think about like advertising today, like, especially in the pandemic, right? There was all of this movement where brands were suddenly going online because all their shops were closed and they had to figure out ways to ultimately like encourage sales during these moments. And so everyone was just looking for ways, like how can we get more money in the door? How can we get new customers? And it was not really about the end consumer, like you or me, like what we really needed or what we really wanted. It was just about sustaining their business. And, you know, it's like, it's so horrible to say because outwardly they're all like, you know, during the pandemic, it's like, Oh, authenticity. They're having all these narratives. They're like, yeah, we want to encourage diversity and inclusion during this time. It's made like the pandemic has made us take a step back, but on the back end of it all, they didn't really care about anything like that. It was like, okay, who can we target? What audiences can we target in which, which areas that are going to spend the most money with us? And like, I was just kind of over that, like, ugh, it kind of, it rubbed me the wrong way. And I'm not, I'm not above capitalism or materialism, but, um, you know, in that moment, I know we all kind of reconsidered, you know, what was important to us. And I had to take a step back and, and figure out what I really wanted to market and, and align myself to. So was it terrifying making the change? It was a little, I was comfortable. Um, you know, I had been in that space for a decade mm -hmm. and I knew the players, I knew the different partners really well. I knew what success looked like and how to achieve it quickly. Um, so it was a little scary taking a, a, a step towards something unfamiliar, but I've never been happier. And I feel like it just goes to show. And I always think about this one quote, which is going to be ridiculous. Um, <laughs> when I read Chris Jenner's memoir, which I know like my references right now are just not incredible, but <laughs> one of the things that she was saying, and she really like honed in on was like every single day, you should be making goals that scare the living daylights out of you. And I was like, you know what? That is so true. Like we do not progress. We do not grow until we get outside of our comfort zones. And like, if I had never left my last company, I would still be doing the exact same thing. Um, I wouldn't even be talking to you. <laughs> I'd be just in my little bubble. And I'm, I'm really glad that I was able to break out. Yeah. And you know, it's so funny because we always think like of dreams and that we have as being so intimidating and so scary, but it's like, it wouldn't be a dream if it wasn't intimidating. Like it has to scare you a little bit to step out and, you know, try something different. Otherwise it wouldn't be something that you wanted so bad. Absolutely. And like, to your point, like that element of emotion, like also signals, it's something that we really want that we're really striving for. If we didn't have that emotion, it's just like, it's just another day. It's just another walk to CVS. It's nothing extraordinary. Right. And with the O2B audience, we're all about the extraordinary, all about mm -hmm. the badassery. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of times we see somebody like you or any of the guests on the show for matter and people worry like, Oh, she's a badass. She's got it all together, but that's not me. Or I couldn't possibly do that. Can you share with us like a hardship that you've had along the way to get to where you are today? Oh yeah. I mean, I think, um, like every day we all have hardships, right? It's just, it's all about perception. And so like, I look at certain women and men in this space. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they 100% have it together. And then you sit down with them and they, you have a conversation and you learn about the obstacles they've had to overcome to get to where they are today. Um, I think early on in my career, I faced a lot of challenges. I think about when I was in sales in particular to start my career, that was 
almost an impossible task, like for me to get up on a daily basis, knowing what I was like walking into. And it was terrifying. And I hated the way that made me feel. I hated like who I was in that time. Um, but I was surrounded by probably 30 other colleagues of mine. I would go into the small little startup every day. I just moved to New York. I wanted to live that New York dream. And it was really tough. I had colleagues who would be like, just shut up. And they would just like be so disrespectful. And they're like, am I talking to you? Did I ask you? And like, it sounds so trivial, but like just the rudeness in the comments that I encountered on like a day-to-day -day basis, like really wore down just who I was as a person. I was like, am I really this good? Like, I know I'm hitting my numbers, but like, should I really be here? Like, are they better fit to lead the sales teams or are they better fit to have my clients? Um, and I really struggled. Like it was horrible. I think I would leave work every single day. I would cry and then I'd be like, okay, I wake up the next day and realize it's a new day. And it did teach me a lot about persistence and that with every day brings new promise and new opportunity. Um, and ultimately, you know, I look back, like it was such a toxic culture, right? Like that wasn't something that I needed to necessarily endure to learn a lot of the lessons, but I didn't know better. Um, and it took me stepping away from that, going to another toxic organization. Um, my, my whole start of my career was just like toxicity. I don't even know if that's really a word. Um, <laughs> it is now. It is now. But I, I worked at a company that was growing really quickly. And I was really excited about it. It was a company that was on Wall Street. And I was like, wow, you know, I've made it. I'm 23. I'm working on Wall Street, um, which little did I know, it really didn't carry the weight that it did when I was watching the movies when I was younger, regardless. Um, but I had it really difficult. Like we were in hyper growth mode. We had a crazy executive team. I had like a COO that was on like a citrus diet. And so he was always hangry and he would get in my face and like yell and then be like, why aren't you doing more? Why aren't you doing more? We need to do X, Y, and Z. And I'd be getting into the office at 5 a.m. every day to meet with my London teams. And I'm like, I can't do physically anymore. And then he would turn around and high five someone who worked for me and be like, great job commuting to the office today. I'll, I know it took two hours and you got here at 10 a.m., but like, good work. I'd be like, what? Like, this isn't fair. Right. And I'd be like, look at the data. I'm driving all these leads. He's missing all these deadlines. I mean, not that you need to bring someone else down, but in my yeah. head, that's what I was right. ultimately doing. And it was once again, just like one of those really toxic work cultures. And I stuck around because everyone was like, it's hyper growth mode. Catherine, if you back away now, like you're missing out on the career move of a lifetime because the company could be acquired. They could go public. And ultimately, once again, I was sitting in my apartment every night crying. And like, I feel like I cried for my, the first three years of my life in New York. And like, that's so horrible. And like, I don't want any young people coming to the city to feel that way. Um, and nor should they like the environments created were just horrible. They didn't foster great talent. They didn't promote growth. Um, and so I think that the start of my career was just really bumpy emotionally for me. So what would you say to the woman who is working on wall street or working somewhere that's in an environment like that, where they don't feel like they're valued. What would you say to her? Get out. There's so many other companies out there. And while it seems like sometimes it can seem like you get in your bubble and you think that is the only bubble that you can possibly be in. It's like, Oh, I don't know. Like if I'll be able to get into the other bubble. But like the fact of the matter is, is everyone is replaceable. Every company is replaceable. Like you just get to choose your own bubble. So like break out, find new bubbles to venture into. Like the world is your oyster, especially now the market is more competitive than ever before. It really is an employee's paradise to figure out like which kind of companies they want to align to. Absolutely. Especially is it now, I think they're calling it like the great resignation. Like people are resigning from their jobs and switching to something they love. So yeah, 
employers really need good employees right now. Absolutely. And I think um, I always think about culture and like how executive teams or boards define culture versus how like the rest of the organization thinks about culture. And like people oftentimes think it's like, oh, let's just write, you know, corporate values down on a website. But like that never translates down to like, you know, the sales floor and how the different sellers or how the different marketers are engaging with one another. And it's like, there's that, there's just like a violent disconnect and it's really sad. And so, yeah, like it's the great resignation. There's about to be a giant new wave of it too, with, you know, everyone getting their year out bonuses. Um, so like find the good employers, find companies where you can look at their executive team and be like, oh, I see representation like myself, or I see more representation, more diversity, um, and they're fostering communities that I want to be a part of. And I know that you talk about like building diverse teams. What is something that employers can do if they want to start building more diverse teams? I mean, you have to be intentional first and foremost. Um, I always think about like recruitment. You can't expect like all of this amazing talent to come to you. You have to actively go out and seek it. And it's kind of like, I always relate that kind of to how people talk about online dating nowadays and how people will be sitting at home and they're like, oh, I'm waiting for my person. I'm waiting for my person. They're like, until you get out there, you're never going to find your person. And so companies need to take that proactive approach to finding the people for them. If you want to bring diverse talent into your organization, be intentional, be proactive. But then I think there is this other element too, like you can do all of that, but you also have to prep your teams to intake diverse talent. Make sure you have unconscious bias training in place and different types of processes to eliminate that in interview cycles or resume reviews. Because unfortunately, we all have unconscious biases. I'm cognizant of mine. Um, and so I have to take an active choice each and every day when I am reviewing resumes to make sure I'm not potentially striking out really great talent. So it's just a matter of like having awareness about it and having those conversations or those trainings kind of within your employment or employer. Well, I think there's a lot more to it. I think yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is the awareness, there is the action, but like education is also really important too. And I think about education in a few different capacities, like when you're talking to the board or the executive team about diversity and I don't necessarily love what I'm about to say, um, but ultimately there is a business case for diversity, right? Like diverse talent, diverse teams are proven to drive more bottom line than less diverse teams. And ultimately it's because everyone is bringing different mindsets to the table. They're able to come together and collaborate and think in creative ways, whereas less diverse teams, you know, copy paste versions of the same person are all going to think one way, kind of in a status quo sense. So like when you're thinking about those conversations and education at the, the highest level with the executive team, like you have to have that business case. As you think about like the rest of the organization, I think it depends um, how those conversations take place and what they consist of and what different types of things you're educating on. But it really is, I think, a case by case basis. Right, right. And I think it's also important, or we forget, this can also be in our personal life, not just business, like Absolutely. having so much, yeah, diversity and knowing different types of people, because otherwise you lose, like you get boring, or if you're around everybody just like you, like that's a boring life. Where's the creativity and the fun, you know? Absolutely. Like, what's that saying? Like the spice of life? Like, <laughs> that's kind of a weird saying. Just ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Earlier, you talked a little bit um, kind of about imposter syndrome or like you were hitting your stats and stuff, but you were kind of doubting yourself and doubting what you were capable of. Is there anything you do now to combat that imposter syndrome or to get more confidence? Yeah. So I think um, the first 
little tidbit of advice that I got that really helped me start tackling imposter syndrome head on was when you're going into a room and you're talking about something, Catherine, and let's say it's a marketing presentation and you're presenting to a group of sales and account managers, you are the marketer. You are the only person that knows marketing. Everyone else is just subjectively giving your opinions. So like you are the expert and you have to take that and run with it and own it. And that really helped me. I was like, you know what? You're right. I am the expert. Like I'm not an expert in sales. I'm well, I technically am because I did start my career in sales. <laughs> I'm not an expert in like account management. I've never done that. And so having that context and also that encouragement to rethink my overall mindset really helped me. There have been a couple other pieces of like tactical bits I've picked up over the years to help combat imposter syndrome. Um, and I always cite like me seeing Michael Phelps at the Olympics, how he would throw on Eminem and like, listen and get really like pumped up. I literally do the same thing for important meetings, important presentations, interviews. I will throw on Cardi B, <laughs> Megan Thee Stallion, and like get really pumped up. And it like really does help you. I know everyone always talks about the psychology behind music and connection. And like, it's wild how different you can come to the table after listening to music that pumps you up. Yeah, I think that's wildly understated or undervalued, you know, because it can just completely change your energy when you're feeling down or crummy um, to put on some good music. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a lot of power in that. And I think that would be my piece of advice, especially for young women as they're entering the workforce. And even, I guess, you know, junior managers too, like you're doing things that are new to you and you may be intimidated by them. Like don't shy away from little tactics that can ultimately help empower you and, and provide that boost in confidence. Like Try, try anything, try everything. You never know what's going to work for you. Yeah. And I know sometimes for women, it can be hard balancing, like moving up in the workplace and family life and all the things, or like not wanting to be too demanding or seem too authoritarian. Um, what do you have any thoughts on that or any feedback on that? It's BS, honestly, like balance is going to look different for everyone. Balance doesn't exist. Um, I don't ever think you're going to have 50, 50, you're going to have maybe 70, 50 or 30, 120. Like <laughs> there's just, it just doesn't exist. Um, when I think about how you balance certain things, like it, especially now more than ever with the pandemic where lines are blurred when we're all working from home. Everything is remote. Your office is in your bedroom or your office is in your living room. There's no disconnect. I just think that it's impossible. Um, now I think you can set boundaries and create the balance that you want to see in your life. Um, but it's a hard conversation and everyone has to do, everyone has to define it for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, there's not a cookie cutter way necessarily, mm -hmm. but it's also important to know your values and know what you want and put those on your priority list as opposed to the things that like drain you. Absolutely. And I think it's okay to also have changing priorities. Like I think about people maybe more junior in their career who maybe don't have families. Like you can dedicate maybe more of your free time if you want to, to that, but you also don't have to. I, um, I think about, I was, I think like 24, one of my best friends, she was working at a Swiss bank and we had met for a happy hour and she was so energized coming to this happy hour. And I'm like, Kristen, what, what is going on? And she was like, I'm part of this women's group at work. And it, I just got out of the best session of my life. And I'm like, tell me more, tell me more. And essentially what this Swiss bank executive was saying was they were speaking to a young group of women. And they were generalizing to a certain degree, but they were saying, you know, when you think about a boss asking you to do something, let's say at 4 PM and one employee says, sorry, I can't because I have my kids soccer game, soccer game. 
And then you look at the other employee and the other employee is like, oh, I had a manicure scheduled. You can't discredit the two things because it's all contextual. And so she walked away that away from that session, understanding that she can have her personal life. Everything, everyone's circumstances are completely different. And ultimately you get to choose the value that you're putting towards these different sorts of activities. And then ultimately choose the balance that you wish to see in your own life. It's up to you. It's not up to your job at all. Yeah. And I don't know what, why this popped up to me, but it's like the guilt sometimes like the guilt Mm -hmm. of not being able to stay later or not being able to do something because you want to um, perform or you want to hit your goals and your whatever. But sometimes there's just this, such a guilt for having to leave at five o'clock and not stay until six o'clock. You know, (laughs) have you ever experienced that? Oh my gosh. Yes. I, um, and I think for a long time, I actually gave into the guilt. And so I would stay late, like until eight o'clock at eight or nine o'clock at night. And I burned out, like I burned out really quickly. And I, it's like that airline thing, like, like put your mask on yourself before you can help others. And it's so true. Like you have to put yourself first. Otherwise you're not going to be able to show up to your family, to your job, to your friends in your best way possible. Yeah, absolutely. It is so hard to do. And I think a lot of times as women we're taught to like, you know, keep everything cool, appease everybody else. No, no worries. No worries. Um, so what have you learned along your journey? Um, kind of going through sales now in marketing, what have you learned along the way? I think that the number one thing I've learned is that, you know, confidence and power are all in ourselves and it's up to ourselves to just unpack. And, and what's the word I'm looking for and embrace. So like, I feel like I didn't realize that for so long. I didn't realize that as women, we do have the confidence and strength within ourselves. We just need to unlock, you know, where it's been buried and hidden and maybe encouraged to stay in the dark. Like we need to embrace all of that. We all have it within ourselves. And once you recognize the power that you have to control your life personally, professionally, and control your future, then I feel like it's really liberating and you understand how much opportunity, like you really have at your fingertips, which is so awesome. And it, I feel like that's so inspirational and so exciting for us all to recognize. And it makes me actually really sad to think about so many generations before us didn't get to necessarily experience that, but like the future ones fully well. Right. Yes. It's like not ever putting ourselves first, or that's what a lot of generations before us have done. Um, Mm -hmm. I know for me, like meditation in this past year, that's what I've been focusing on. And it's been absolutely a game changer for like my confidence and just not having so much self-doubt, like it just kind of cements me like, nope, I know what, how I feel. I know what I'm talking about. You know, um, mm-hmm. what about you? Has there been anything like any type of morning routine or anything that you do to help you get in touch with yourself? So I adopted two dogs last year, um, which was a big undertaking as someone who has never owned dogs before, but having animals and best friends that I have to care for and show up for every day and create routine really helped reset my intentions kind of on a daily basis, like going outside four or five times a day to go on walks also just really helps me kind of get into a good mindset, like understand like, Oh, you know, what do I want to prioritize today? Or, Oh, maybe I want to rethink you know, what I'm considering doing in a year, like just having these moments to myself, I mean, and with my little furry friends, um, has really helped me. It it's been nice to get away mentally. I think from, I'm sure like with meditation too, right? Like get away from the news cycles that are just horrible or get away from work, which can be really all encompassing. Um, so that's what, that's what I do. I connect with my little furry friends, uh, on our walks. 
it really is amazing what like a five or 10 minute walk, just even just getting out, like how that can just refresh your mindset. Absolutely. And you know what I think about, um, this is going to be an interesting reference, but over the course of the pandemic, so I got on TikTok, I'm obsessed with consuming <laughs> the content. And one of the trends I kept seeing was called this hot girl walk. And at first I was like, what is this like diet industry BS? And then I realized it's all about this mindset and how putting on good music, just moving your body can help clear your mind, help create this like this incredible mindset where you just feel like your best self. And it really is so true. Like a five or 10 minute walk is all, all it takes. I mean, if you do do like maybe an hour, it really will do wonders. But, um, to your point, like five minutes out the door in nature with some sunshine will just perk you right up. <laughs> okay. But now you got me wanting to look up the hot girl walk. Cause I don't know what that's about. <laughs> I mean, I can only imagine <laughs> if you go on Spotify, there's like thousands of playlists just called hot girl walk. And honestly, these women who and men who have assembled them incredible playlists. I think I, I am subscribed to like 15 of them. They're really great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So good. I'll have to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> so being in sales, being in marketing, I would assume that's maybe it's changing now, but I would assume over time it's kind of been predominantly men. Is that accurate? Yeah, absolutely. When I started my, um, when I started my career in sales, I was an SDR, one of five, I was the only one woman. Um, we then created a massive kind of SDR class. I was still the only woman of like 30 men, uh, which was once again, interesting dynamic, as you can imagine, probably not healthy or super fun to walk into on a daily basis. So yeah, it was, it was weird. And they all looked the same too. Like not only was it all men, but it was all white men. Right. So that can be intimidating and it's in any environment where you're the only one that either looks like you or you're the only one of your gender or your race or whatever it is, it can feel intimidating. Um, what did you do to feel comfortable with standing out or just being yourself? That's a great question. I distanced myself, um, which I don't know if that's the best advice, but like, I didn't want to be a part of that group. I wanted to put my head down. Ultimately, I wanted to succeed. I wanted to be recognized. I wanted to be promoted, but I also didn't want to open myself up to the criticism that could potentially come with me trying to fit in. And I think about, you know, it was a group of like, there were so many, they were all in their young twenties and they'd be like, Hey, Catherine, we're going out for a beer after work. Want to come? And I'd be like, Oh, like you want to belong. Like you want to have that work community. But I was nervous, like being the only woman joining all of these men where alcohol is made me really nervous. And so I just stepped away from potentially any risk and like, that sucked too. Right. Like they would come in the next day. Everyone's like, buddy, buddy, like, Oh my God, we had the best time last night. And I'm like, damn, like, am I doing something wrong by, you know, taking a step back and just trying to protect myself? Like I want to be in on the fun, but at the same time, they all kind of suck. So do I really want to be? And it was like this, like I was in high school again too. Right. We're like, the cool kids could be the most boring people ever, but like you want to belong, you want to be a part of something. And ultimately I was able to become a part of something. And that was the top performers at the company. And it wasn't necessarily like the top performers in sales. It was just the folks that had the most potential. And so I ultimately then would start aligning myself with, you know, maybe it was a senior account manager or someone in accounts payable. And it got to the point where it was so nice where my CEO even was recognizing me. And I'm like, this is so much better than being a part of their lame group going out to get beers at 5 p.m. on a Tuesday. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and I think it's so interesting because there are those dynamics. So I work in law enforcement and I get it. I'm, you know, a female where it's a primarily male-dominated field. So, <laughs> and I, like you, kind of 
distance myself. Like instead of going out for beers or whatever, it's like, uh, eh, this is what I'll do. But I don't know that there's a right or a wrong way. You just kind of got to do what it fits right for you, you know? Yeah. And you probably also, it's probably contextual too, right? Which is not anything anyone ever wants to hear. Like you want to be given that direction. Like this is what you should do, or this is what you shouldn't do. But sometimes you really have to trust your gut. And I think about the gut, right. As this thing where people are like, oh, but like, you know, sometimes instincts are wrong. And I heard this woman the other day say something that really resonated with me. She was like, your gut is based off of your past experiences. That's what ultimately informs. So like you are using data to make this decision. And I was like, wow, like sometimes I would, I would nod off my, my gut instinct because I thought I was, you know, I was like, where is this even coming from? But it's like, give yourself more credit. Um, so I think in these certain instances, in these different scenarios, you have to just trust yourself. Does this feel right? Or does it maybe feel a little iffy? If you're getting the, like the easiest bit of iffy run, it's not worth it. <laughs> I love that. So good. So good. And, you know, previously we had Marlene Bjornsrud on the podcast and she was like a consultant for the Olympics committee and she worked with women's soccer a lot. And, you know, she said kind of on her way up, especially consulting with the Olympics and stuff, she used to go out with the guys and drink just to try to fit in and she'd feel hungover and feel gross. And she's like, I just realized that wasn't authentic to me just because I wanted to fit in and it wasn't something I would ordinarily do. And that was kind of a game changer for her when she realized like, I don't have to do that to be good at my job, you know? So I think it's important to kind of look at the different aspects. Yeah, that's a really good point too, around authenticity. Like sometimes at these companies that maybe aren't like the right fit for like anyone and everyone, like we do things that are out of character because we do want to fit in, but it is really important to take a step back and realize like you work for a company. The company is not controlling your life. Like you have the power and authority to define what you want to do. And you don't have to fit in if you don't necessarily want to, but like stay authentic to you because at the end of the day, like you're the only one that answers to you. Like these other folks don't, um, <laughs> I think, yeah, I think that's a really good point that she made. Yeah. And kind of to what you said, it's like, you have to sleep with yourself at night, you know, like you have to be able to go to bed and feel comfortable with your decisions. And so that's more important than what somebody else thinks of you. Absolutely. I, um, I saw this quote the other day that was saying, if you won't remember something in five years, don't spend more than five minutes thinking or debating it. And like, that was so powerful because there's been so many times in my career where I'm like agonizing over something. And it's like, okay, this is just our job. Like in five years, are we really going to remember if I sent a snarky email back to someone who was rude to me? Probably not. Although I actually am vividly remembering a horrible email that I received five years ago. So maybe that's not the best example, but I do think there's a lot of power in, in that quote itself. Right. Right. Or putting it in perspective a little bit, like the things we're stressing out or putting our time on or focus on. Yeah, absolutely. We all have a certain amount in our tank. Like where do we want to, where do we want to put it? Right. Right. Absolutely. So I know we're winding down here. Um, one thing I would love to know is if you have any like book recommendations, like a book that has made a big impact for you. I don't, I have so many leadership books on <laughs> my coffee table, but what I can actually suggest is, um, a podcast, which feels a little weird considering we're in a podcast hey, right now. Good. Um, I love the nine to five by the scam. I think the way in which, and some of their older episodes are really, really good. Like from 2019, I would suggest people listen to those. You just get fantastic executive women who like kind of to your earlier point, like you, you look at some of them and you're like, wow, you're the CEO of XYZ bank on the cover of Forbes. Your life is perfect. And then you hear them sit down on this couch and get vulnerable and hear their stories and you realize, wow, they're just like me. I have the potential to also be on the cover of Forbes. Um, so I, I would, that. 
I would listen. I would listen to nine to five by the scam. Yes. I'm definitely going to check it out. So let's end with a tip to encourage women who are in the arena fighting for the life that they want. So I'm going to sound a little bit repetitive, but I think the most important thing to take away is that we individually have power inside ourselves as well as amongst each other together. And we collectively can strive for change. Every day is a new day, a new opportunity to tackle something or really make impact. And so just because something bad happened to you yesterday, or maybe you were said no to yesterday, tomorrow is a new day. Um, You may be able to find your yes. You may be able to find the new opportunity that you've been looking for. Just keep your head high. There's so much power and positivity. Um, And together, I think we can really make the changes that we want to see for ourselves and future generations. So that's my little piece of advice. So good. Thank you so much, Catherine. You've been a total badass and I've enjoyed hearing your story. Thanks, Marie. And with that, we'll end our show. To all the badass women out there staying in the arena, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, own it and get after it.